Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. We have a guest speaker today. Um, Reverend Dr. Nathan Jishin Michan is with us today to offer our Dharma talk. But before we get started with Sunday service, I have just a few housekeeping things to share. We are recording the Zoom session to post on the socials after the talk. And while we hope to see many of your faces in this Zoom room, if you prefer to remain anonymous, all you have to do is disable the video and change your Zoom profile name by clicking on the three dots at the top of your picture. We will begin today with the three refuges followed by the Heart Sutra, which starts on page seven of our rituals and practices booklet, which should be in the chat. If you don't have a copy handy, um, it should be right at the bottom of the chat for easy convenience. At the end of the Dharma talk, everyone will be unmuted and there will be space for conversation and connection, something we call our virtual tea. So we hope you will join us there. And if anyone is joining us for the first time, please know that we strive to be a loving, inclusive community that will welcome you warmly. So please feel free to take part in any or all of our service today, or simply observing is just great too. And if you have any questions afterward, you can reach out to a teacher during our virtual tea. Um, and also all of our clergy contact information is on our website. And finally, many thanks to Brian, who is supporting all of our techniques today. So to begin our time together today, please join me in reciting the three refuges followed by the Heart Sutra, page seven and eight in the ritual booklet. <clears throat> I go for refuge to Buddha, my deeply awakened mind, the living source of understanding and compassion, which must be cultivated to be known fully. I go for refuge to Dharma, the path of mindful living, leading to healing, joy, and enlightenment, the way of peace, which must be cultivated to be known fully. I go for refuge to the Sangha, the loving and supportive community of practice, realizing harmony, awareness, and liberation, which must be cultivated to be known fully. I am aware that the three jewels are within my heart. I vow to realize them. I vow to understand living beings and their suffering. I vow to cultivate loving kindness and compassion and to practice joy and equanimity. I vow to live simply and sanely, content with few possessions, and to keep my body healthy. I vow to let go of all worry and anxiety in order to be light and free. I am aware that I owe so much to my parents, teachers, friends, and all beings. I vow to be worthy of their trust to practice wholeheartedly so that understanding and compassion will flower and I can help living beings be free from their suffering. May the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha support my efforts. May the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha support my efforts. May the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha support my efforts. And now the Heart Sutra. The Maha 
Prajna Paramita Vredaya Sutra The Bodhisattva of great compassion from the deep practice of Prajna Paramita perceived the emptiness of all five skandhas and delivered all beings from their suffering. O Shariputra, form is no other than emptiness, emptiness no other than form, form is emptiness, emptiness form. The same is true of feeling, thought, impulse, and consciousness. O Shariputra, all dharmas are empty. They are not born nor annihilated. They are not defiled nor immaculate. They do not increase nor decrease. So in emptiness, no form, no feeling, no thought, no impulse, no consciousness, no eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. No form, sound, smell, taste, touch, or objects of mind. No realm of sight, no realm of consciousness. No ignorance, nor extinction of ignorance. No old age and death, nor extinction of them. No suffering, no cause of suffering, no cease from suffering, no path to lead out of suffering, no knowledge, no attainment, no realization, for there is nothing to attain. The Bodhisattva holds on to nothing, but prajna paramita. Therefore, the mind is clear of any delusive hindrance. Without hindrance, there is no fear. Away from all perverted views, one reaches final nirvana. All Buddhas of past, present, and future through faith in prajna paramita attain to the highest perfect enlightenment know then the prajna paramita is the great dharani the radiant peerless mantram the utmost supreme mantram which is capable of allaying all pain. This is true beyond all doubt. Proclaim now the highest wisdom, the prajna paramita. Gate, gate, para gate, para sam gate. Bodhisattva Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisattva Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisattva, the Maha Prajna Paramita Redaya Sutra.
Good morning, everyone. Once again, my name is Aisu, and I'm honored to introduce our guest speaker for today. Reverend Dr. Nathan Jishin Mishan is an ordained Buddhist priest in the Koyasan Shingon tradition of Japan and an interfaith minister and co-director of the Interfaith Ministry for the Unity and Diversity World Council based in LA. After receiving an MA in Comparative Religion from Western Michigan University, he completed an MDiv, Master's in Divinity, in Buddhist Chaplaincy at the University of the West and a PhD in History and Cultures of Religions at Graduate Theological Union. <clears throat> He is the editor of A Thousand Hands, A Guide to Carist, Caring for Your Buddhist Community, and the forthcoming Refuge in the Storm, Buddhist Voices in Crisis Care, and the co-author of the Oxford Encyclopedia Entry on Buddhist Chaplaincy. He is also a friend of the Grand Rapids Buddhist Temple, having occupied a cushion in our Dharma Hall many times. Please join me in offering a deep bow to Jishin this morning. Oh, first of all, thank you so much, Venerable Aisu, and for the whole Grand Rapids Buddhist Temple community. It's thank you so much for having me today, and it's wonderful to be here together, <laughs> um, even virtually. Uh, it's great seeing even some of your faces flash across the screen. Um, so wonderful to see you again, and. To those who I haven't met yet, wonderful to meet you even in this virtual environment. Um, so I am talking mostly today about Buddhist care and chaplaincy, and especially in the contexts of Japan, where I spent most of the past half decade. Um, however, I'm also couching this in the context of right speech or a sort of subcategory of that I'm calling right listening. And so I'm sure most of you are very familiar with right speech as a part of the Noble Eightfold Path. It's got a very key place in the Buddhist tradition. Uh, one of the teachings the Buddha talks about in determining right speech, it, there's three little checkpoint questions. Uh, one, is it true? Two, is it beneficial? And three, is it timely? So, of course, sometimes we can have something to say that might be true, but it's not necessarily beneficial. Or maybe it's something that really would be beneficial and is definitely true, but it's maybe just not quite the right time. So we also have to feel the atmosphere, feel the situation, and make sure it's all of those things, true, beneficial, and timely. Um, have just a short sutra reading here that goes into some of the details of right speech, but where the Buddha talks about more so the positive aspects of right speech. In many sutras he talks about what right speech is not. <laughs> so it's a little more rare that he talks about what is right speech. So I'll just read a short selection from that. Right speech is dot, dot, dot. Reconciling those who have broken apart or cementing those who are united. The person practicing right speech loves a concord, delights in concord, enjoys concord, speaks things that create concord. They abandon harsh speech, they abstain from harsh speech. They speak words that are soothing, pleasing to the air, affectionate, that go to the heart, that are polite, appealing, 
and pleasing to people at large. Abandoning idle chatter, they abstain from idle chatter. They speak in season, speaking what is based in fact and what is in accordance with the Dharma and the goal of the Dharma. They speak words that are treasuring, timely, reasonable, circumscribed, connected to the goal. So we see a lot of the positive aspects that Buddha repeats there. I think one other interesting part of right speech to think about is how the Buddha answers questions himself. And there was an interesting analysis that a monk Tanasaro Bhikkhu did of all the Nikaya Sutras, the Pali Canon Sutras, and categorizing all of the different responses that the Buddha gave. And he broke it down into saying, there's really four different ways that the Buddha responds to questions. And one way is by analyzing the different parts of the question. Uh, one is by giving categorical answers, different sets of numbers. If you've read sutras, you've probably seen many of those numbered sets. And a third one is cross-questioning. So he takes a question and then he asks a question back. And a fourth one is with silence, not responding at all. And of course, that can have many different situations and contexts to it. But I think it's especially these last two that are really applicable in chaplaincy and caregiving and listening. Um, so it's when in a situation of professional chaplaincy, for example, um, maybe with a patient in a hospital, there's a lot of situations where there's not really the right thing to quote unquote say in that moment. But really what is just needed is your presence, your silent presence with the person. Um, just compassionately opening your heart to them and being with them. And also asking questions back to another. So when we hear maybe a tough question, say a patient asks, what happens when you die? What do you say? But what's really important is not what I think in that situation. What's important is what the patient needs themselves. And so I might ask something back. What do you, but making sure it's compassionate and open to them. What do you think happens after death? What, what is important to you about this? And so if possible, keeping the focus on them and their own needs. And if possible, helping them to discover and find the own answers to their questions. And so chaplaincy is, um, there are volunteers, chaplains, of course, but it's also a professional field and there are training programs around the US. There are even now numerous Buddhist chaplaincy training programs. And so for a professional chaplain, it can on average require about a three years of graduate education and a year or so of CPE. That's essentially a chaplaincy internship. Um, and so it is an established field of spiritual care. But around the world, these standards are very different. And in Japan, recently, they've been really influenced by American chaplaincy 
but also are working it into their own history and traditions and culture. So they've created a lot new uh, Buddhist chaplaincy tradition um, within their own country. Now, I, I also want to state that just because this modern version of Buddhist chaplaincy is fairly new around the past decade, that doesn't mean that Buddhist spiritual care didn't exist before. So um, even in Japan, it's really been around basically since the beginning of Buddhism entering Japan in history. Uh, one of the first major temples, monasteries uh, in the present day Nara Osaka area, um, it was called Shitanoji. And they had a hospice area within the temple, a kind of apothecary medicine area, a area for social welfare, for meeting the needs of the impoverished, and um, for the like general sickly as well. So it, all of the essentially doctors and nurses of the time, they were almost all Buddhist monks and nuns. And through the vast majority of Japanese history up to almost the modern period, uh, that was the case through most of the local communities. The Buddhist monks and nuns were the main ones who could read, who trained in reading, and who read all these texts. And they also knew something about medicine and taking care of people. So when people went to the temple, it could be for services, regular services, but it could also be as a type of clinic. And so um, throughout much of Japanese history and in a lot of other Buddhist countries as well, uh, this was really normal. <laughs> and so there was a lot of spiritual care and holistic forms of care that developed throughout that time. Um, just for a brief moment, I'm gonna share my screen though to talk about some modern forms of care that developed. Because in Japan, so sometimes good actions result from harsh situations and tragedies. And in Japan in particular, uh, the large earthquake and tsunami uh, that occurred in 2011 um, was a giant tragedy. I had almost 20,000 people um, perishing that day. The waves reached almost 100 feet high in the, their highest locations and swept in almost three miles inland. So it was a massive tragedy that occurred. Uh, but out of this, thousands and thousands of volunteers came and wanted to care for all the people there. Um, so one of the initiatives that started up over in Japan was this Café de Monk, a traveling café. And it's a play on words uh, because monku in Japanese means to complain. But monk in English, of course, is monk. <laughs> so it was a, a place that you could come and complain about your life to the monks, <laughs> to the volunteer monks on hand. Um, the founder was a Zen priest who's pictured here. And he set this up mostly as a place where people, it wasn't easy, especially in Japanese culture, for people to talk about their troubles to others. And so, a cafe environment especially was a nice setting where people could 
sit, relax, have a kind of oasis amid all the chaos. And then if they wanted to talk about something, the volunteers were on hand to listen and be with people as they finally opened up and spoke about everything they went through. Uh, however, the organizer, he would often, uh, they, they would travel to many, many different areas, especially at first around the different disaster sites. So it was more of a traveling cafe. Uh, but they would also have different activities like making juzus, prayer beads, and sometimes songs and other things just to brighten the mood and give people some, again, oasis to be in. And thankfully, this activity spread around Japan and now is they have Café de Monks in some local hospices and they set them up in numerous places after disasters occur around the country. But it also became really apparent that just coming to a large disaster situation and wanting to help wasn't necessarily enough because just because you want to help, we have to, of course, balance compassion and wisdom, right? Um, so we can't just have compassion, but we need the wisdom for care as well. How do you care for somebody who's been traumatized in this kind of a situation? Um, one of the women I met there, for example, lost about half of her village that was on the coast. Um, losing half of the people you know in one day, of course, is an immense tragedy you can't immediately get over. And so teaching the different ways to care for others was really important. And so they began to set up different programs around the around Japan. This is um, Taniyama Sensei, Taniyama Yozo pictured here, who's really one of the key figures in setting, helping to set up a lot of the initial programs and the, the organizational structures that helped other programs around Japan develop in the years after that. And these are pictures of some of the students I went to see. I spent a year or so going around to 11 different training programs that developed in Japan since then. And one of the things they do is put themselves in a kind of harsh environment or a um, tragic environment. And so the students went to the site of the big tsunami. This was a school that was actually flooded up to the middle of the second floor. And they also traveled to Hiroshima, um, to the site of the atomic bombing. And both places heard stories of survivors, um, both of the tsunami and the bombing. And then afterwards, with these stories deep in their hearts would practice with each other um, role-playing situations in which they'd, one person would pretend to be a, a patient, another the chaplain, and then practice their listening skills and how they would deal with different situations. And <laughs> a number of different programs developed. Uh, this, this is me with another monk called Oshta Dayan. Uh, he's also a Shingon priest. He recently developed this building over on this side, the outside over here is, let's see, it's called the World Harmony Meditation Center. Um, he built it on the grounds of his temple 
does a lot of different retreats there. He even integrated from Christian monasteries a, um, a labyrinth into it. So he has also multi-faith retreats and brings in things from different traditions. Um, but he even developed, besides his own chaplaincy program that he leads, he also leads a program for doctors and nurses, um, a multi-stage, multi-year program in teaching them uh, contemplative and meditative therapies um, inspired from different meditative traditions. And he himself is a trained music therapist and for a couple decades has combined his chaplaincy work with music therapy and he worked into it meditation traditions and chanting, um, traditional Buddhist chanting to create this chanting meditative therapy, <laughs> um, especially for terminal cancer patients. And so a lot of different people doing really a lot of interesting work there. This is the opening ceremony for that center. Um, this is another temple that's been around actually longer, um, which based on a Pure Land tradition, uh, created Nikon therapy, uh, which has also been used in some of the training sessions and is very based on internal um, reflection and gratitude to the people you know. Um, so this is a really complicated picture, but just briefly shows that despite most of this happening within less than 10 years, a lot of different training programs, uh, Cafe de Monks, and other areas, uh, established hospitals that now accept Buddhist chaplains in um, to volunteer or work there. Basically, all of these little arrows and Japanese names are places where that's been established in the past decade. So it's quite a flowering of activity that's gone on. <laughs> Just to finish up with a few things to bring it back to right speech and right listening. Uh, one of the one of the friends I made over there made a really cool manga book, a graphic novel in Japanese, uh, chronicling her own experience as a woman Buddhist priest and a chaplain who trained and went into hosp hospices and hospitals over there. Um, she made a whole book about her experience. <laughs> and so this is from me translating it, a couple little pictures. But there, of course, there's no hard and fast rules, but there are some nice things to avoid when trying to listen to others. Uh, for example, spouting out the answers to their problems. Sometimes we want to just say, oh, you can do this. <laughs> but of course, to just try to listen instead and find out what is their needs uh, is often in most situations much more helpful. Um, sometimes we also have to be careful about maybe being over commiserating or encouraging. Uh, of course, again, different situations can have different responses, but I, if we're too encouraging, oh, you can get through this when a person is in the stage, stage of just feeling, I don't know how I can get through this. Sometimes that can feel really oppressive as well. So again, listening to their needs first. Um, another thing that can happen, oh, I totally understand what you're going through. Well, Maybe you can't. <laughs> so, of course, again, 
uh, bringing the focus back to them and their needs, um, trying to understand what, what is their pain, being with them through that instead. And of course, not diminishing it as well. And so one big theme, uh, not just of Buddhist chaplaincy, but all chaplaincy is not doing, but being. But you can see how this uh, is very relevant to Buddhists as well. And our presence is often just a really big, important thing that many people need. Just somebody to go through that together with. So, so don't ignore your own capacity for presence and being with someone because sometimes you don't have to say anything at all and that's okay uh, just being there with them can also be an appropriate response so thank you <laughs> and now we'll just do a short meditation Take a few deep breaths in and out. Relaxing your body, relaxing your mind. Imagine feeling of metta, loving kindness inside of you, spreading throughout your body. Then imagine somebody in front of you. Somebody may be suffering. So compassionately reaching that loving kindness out to them, feeling compassion for their needs. being equanimous about the situation as well. Not feeling flustered, being around their suffering. Still maintaining your presence of mind. being with them, comfortable in that space. Of course, it might not come easy, and that's okay. The word most often 
translated into meditation in Pali, bhavana, means simply cultivating the mind and heart. So this is all an exercise. Something we work at. Improving not just our attention and awareness, but also our compassion, loving kindness, equanimity, or joy. Thank you so much, Jishin, for um, the talk and for the meditation. Um, we're very grateful that you were with us today. Um, and if we can, Brian, um, open it up so that anyone who has an announcement can share that. Good morning, Sangha. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know we are still doing our morning um, book study club uh, at 930 in the park uh, at Riverside Park, um, and we are still incorporating Zoom. Um, we're working on it. It's a little, it's in the works, but uh, we're going to be doing chapter 36 and 37, two chapters this week. Just letting everyone know. Good morning. Um, thank you, Reverend Dr. Nathan Jishin and Mishan for giving your time and insights into the outreach of Buddhist teachings this morning. Just as this monk volunteered his time today, the temple operates solely by volunteer efforts to provide all programming and donations to pay all bills. As we begin to reopen the temple and reintroduce programming, I invite you to express your gratitude by continuing your participation and donating online at zengr.org slash donate. Thank you for joining us. I also want to, oh, are we opening it up for discussion? No, not quite yet, just announcements. Any others? Okay, to, um, to close our service today, Jishin has something a little bit different planned for us. Um, so I'll just turn it right back over to him. So this is just, kind of in line with the talk and meditation, the metta sutta. And I think it was just put in the chat. So if you want to follow along with this transition translation, you are welcome to. This is to be done by one skill to names who wants to break through to the state of peace. Be capable, upright, and straightforward, easy to instruct, gentle, and not conceited, content and easy to support, with few duties, living lightly, with peaceful faculties, masterful, modest, and no greed for supporters. Do not do the slightest thing that the wise would later censure. Think happy and secure. May all beings be happy at heart. Whatever beings there may be, weak or strong without exception. Long, large, middling, short, subtle and blatant. Seen and unseen, near and far, born and seeking birth. May all beings be happy at heart. Let no one deceive another, nor despise anyone anywhere, nor through anger nor irritation wish for another to suffer. 
as a mother would risk her life to protect her only child. Just so should one cultivate the heart limitlessly with regard to all beings. With good will for the entire cosmos, cultivate a limitless heart above, below, and all around, unobstructed without enmity or hate. Whether standing, walking, sitting, or lying down, as long as one is alert, one should be resolved on this mindfulness. This is called the sublime abiding, not taken with views, but virtuous and consummate in vision. Having subdued craving for sense pleasures, one never again will lie in the womb. Thank you.